Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, just one announcement before we begin. This is not church, so you are allowed to sit in the front. All right, so please feel free to move down front, and we'll have a little more intimate gathering. But I want to welcome you to St. Charles Borromeo Seminary for this, the third annual John Cardinal Foley Lecture in Social Communications. The series honors the legacy of Cardinal John Patrick Foley, a native of Philadelphia and longtime president of the Pontifical Council for Social Communications. In his work, Cardinal Foley saw the world in this way. These are his words. As an interconnected globe humming with electronic transmissions, a chattering planet nestled in the provident silence of space. In that world, he recognized and championed the decisive importance of social communications as the means for determining our culture. We are blessed this evening to have as our lecturer one who keeps that humming globe and chattering planet in motion in terms of how the church interacts with contemporary culture. A priest in the Congregation of St. Basil, he holds advanced degrees in sacred scripture from Regis College in Toronto, the Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome, and the École Biblique in Jerusalem. For him, the hum of global transmissions first became a reality when he served for three years as National Director of World Youth Day and the visit of Pope John Paul II that took place in Toronto in 2002. Following that, he founded the Salt and Light Catholic Media Foundation and still serves as its chief executive officer. As Canada's first Catholic television network, which now reaches across continents, Salt and Light TV plays a vital part in determining Catholic culture through the medium of storytelling, with the aim of bringing people closer to Christ and to our faith. But since 2008, he has not had much experience with what Cardinal Foley described as the silence of space. That's because he is in constant connection with Rome as a member of the staff of the Holy See's press office. As an official spokesperson, he brings news about Pope Francis and the Vatican to the entire English-speaking world through his daily interactions with the media. Tonight, we are honored that he has come here as the third John Cardinal Foley Lecturer. So would you please join me in welcoming Father Thomas Rosica. Thank you, Father Tom, Archbishop Chaput, Bishop Senior, dear brothers and sisters, dear friends. Thanks for the privilege of addressing you this evening in a lecture series in memory of a great personal friend and mentor Cardinal John Foley. It's a privilege to be here at a place that he often spoke about with glowing terms and much nostalgia and fondness. Your hospitality to me over the past weekend is much appreciated. It's been a real oasis of peace. No secret service, no police. It's been very enjoyable. <laughs> the topic I've chosen to speak on is sharing the joy of the gospel with the media and through the media. It's a very fitting topic for a man after whom this series is named. For that's exactly what Father and then Archbishop and Cardinal Foley did his entire life. He lived and shared the gospel of joy with the media and through the media to the entire world. First of all, let's take a panoramic look at how people throughout the ages have communicated the faith and passed on this message. Beginning with the oral tradition, including the teaching ministry of Jesus, and continuing through the formation of the biblical canon to modern telecommunications, human beings have always recorded, shared, and communicated the faith. The history of faith is a history of communication. For Christians, the word did not become a divine oracle from some distant heaven. A fax, if you still remember what a fax is, the other day I spoke and somebody didn't know what it was, an email, SMS or text message, a probe, a prompt, a quick like, or some other newfangled way to grab attention. Through Mary, the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. The word became close to real human beings in real time. The word became a person 
to be followed, enjoyed, touched, and loved. And from that moment onward, anybody who really understands that God became human will never be able to speak and act in an inhuman way. In Jesus, the message and the messenger are united. The medium is indeed the message, and the life and witness of the messengers are always a vital part of the message. Let us never forget that. In every age in church history, the church has used whatever media are available to spread the good news. Just stop and think for a moment. St. Augustine practically invented the form of autobiography. The builders of great medieval cathedrals used stone and stained glass to teach a powerful lesson about God's dwelling place among us. Renaissance popes used not only papal bulls, but magnificent colorful frescoes. Hildegard of Bingen wrote the first opera. Francis de Sales wrote thousands of letters to people. The early Jesuits used whatever theater and stagecraft to put on morality plays for entire towns and villages. Dorothy Day founded a newspaper that still exists today, The Catholic Worker. Jesuit Father Daniel Lord jumped into radio. Bishop Fulton Sheen, who was my bishop for three years in Rochester, New York, used television to a stunning effect, even to receiving Emmy Awards. And Bishop Robert Barron has dazzled all of us with masterful teaching videos. And now we have popes and cardinals and bishops and priests and sisters and brothers and sisters and tons of Catholic laity blogging and tweeting their brains out. How sad it would be if we did not use the latest tools available to us to communicate and share the word of God and the story of the church. In nearly three years, at the helm of the Roman Catholic Church, Pope Francis, your former guest here in September, has opened the floodgates of communication in an institution that seemed somewhat cloistered for centuries. Yes, his two immediate predecessors, John Paul II and Benedict, communicated through the media. But let me tell you that something new is afoot. Pope Francis is now among the top, top global newsmakers of our time, and it's already three years since he assumed his new office. He has brought renewed visibility to the papacy and the church. While it's no exaggeration that a pope has never been so widely quoted by the secular press, it could also be said that the pope's intentions have never been so widely misinterpreted. He is not quite conservative, nor entirely progressive. His message is filled with paradoxes because life is a paradox, and Christian life is a great paradox. The world is listening to him because Francis models a solid consistency, the one between his words and deeds, and that between its current papal mission and life eternal. People listen to him because he walks the talk and walks the walk. He speaks our talk. Francis is the world's shepherd and a beautiful model and example of the new evangelization in action. And he wasn't even at the synod of new evangelization in 2012. Many have said he's the first product, the first fruit of that synod several months later. What is his most important achievement to the present? From my perspective, I believe that he's rebranded Catholicism and the papacy. Prior to Francis, especially in the immediate years preceding the election, many people on the street would be asked, what is the Catholic Church all about? What do we stand for? And the answer came back very frequently, Catholics, while well, you're against abortion, against gay marriage, and against birth control, you're well known for your sex abuse crisis, that's terribly marred and weakened your moral authority and credibility. Almost every time I would send out camera crews, streeters as we call them, to get footage for different stories we're doing, we go into big squares and public areas in Toronto, and time after time, this is all we were able to pick up from people. And many of them were Catholics who were saying it. Today the response is a bit different. What do they talk about now? What do they say about the Pope? They're speaking about our leader who's unafraid to convince, confront sins and evils that have marred us. A pope who is concerned about environment, about mercy, compassion and love, and a deep passion and concern and care for the poor. He's won over a great part of the media. By no means is this an indication that the teachings of the church and message of the gospel have been fully understood, embraced, and received by all. Nevertheless, something has shifted in terms of church media relations. Many of my colleagues in the secular media industry with whom I relate almost on a daily basis have said that Francis has made it fun to be a religion reporter and journalist again. 
And the re recent papal visit to the United States was certainly proof of that. Francis has changed the image of the church so much that prestigious graduate schools in this country and in Canada, schools that specialize in business and management, are now using him as case studies in rebranding. He's ruffled many feathers and upset some folks because of his free-flowing, unscripted remarks at times. And he does raise a few eyebrows now and then. Initially, many of us, myself included, may have thought that his accessibility, free-flowing interviews, homilies, and quotes are much more a source of consternation and frustration than opportunities to deepen our knowledge about the church, her founder, and her message. But Francis has chosen many different opportunities to speak and encounter the world. No matter how fraught with potential or real confusion, the world is listening to the Pope in ways that have not happened for a long time, for a long, long time. No longer can we simply attribute this interest to an initial fascination, a honeymoon period, or other cynical ways of trying to dismiss what is truly happening. The world is listening because Francis and the church have something solid to say and to offer a world that's plunged in chaos, war, terror, violence, moral deprivation, despair, and darkness. He's given us an opportunity to teach, catechize, and evangelize those establishments, agencies, and individuals that bring us the news and the consumers of that news. The inability of commentators to pigeonhole Francis into a single category is frustrating for some people. Francis does not compromise on hot-button issues that divide the church from the secular West a gap that liberals would like to close by simply modernizing doctrine. Yet he's also not a pope for the Catholic right. For him, contrasting positions, held together in tension, loyal to fundamentals but open to the action of the Holy Spirit are necessary to forge a new, better consensus, and the differences make for an honest, open discussion. Look at what Pope Francis said to the special session of the United States Congress last September, and more how he said it. He didn't scold, chastise, excoriate, condemn, or excommunicate those powerful women men sitting before him, many of whom were Catholics. Rather, he urged lawmakers to build on their great history, to draw from their deepest traditions and principles. He upheld examples that astounded us for individuals that wouldn't one, ex one would not expect to come from the mouth of a pope. He reminded them of the good that they've done in the past, which serves an example of the good they can and should do in the future. And I quote, our response must indeed be one of hope and healing, of peace and justice. We are asked to summon the courage and the intelligence to resolve today's many geopolitical and economic crises. Even in the developed world, the effects of unjust strictures and actions are all too apparent. Our efforts must aim at restoring hope, righting wrongs, maintaining commitments, and thus promoting the well-being of individuals and of all peoples. We must move forward together as one in a renewed spirit of fraternity and solidarity, cooperating generously for the common good." End of quote. This was hardly a call to overthrow the system that the Pope's more radical-minded fans would have us believe. Instead, he asked us to call on all that's best, good, and true in our society. On Saturday, I had to take a taxi, or an Uber, I should say, which is very good. Took an Uber from here to a meeting I had at a downtown hotel with some film producers. On the way back, I had an Afro-American driver bring me back. And as we neared the property here, he said, ooh, brother, he said, you know what happened here? And I said, what happened here? There was a big guest here in September. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm staying in the house there. That's where he is. And he said, you know what he did? I said, yeah, he did a lot of good when he was here. And he said, did you watch what he did in Congress? And he was talking just like that. And I said, yeah, I did. It was pretty amazing. You know what he did, brother? He called for our better angels. He just ended it like that when I, I left the car. And I thought of those words, and I changed my talk because of what he said. I added this. Francis's words to Congress in that historic gathering in September did not fall on deaf ears of the media and the millions who watched that historic event. Tenor and tone, eye contact and gestures, Kindness, gentleness, and firmness all met together and did indeed call forth our better angels. 
what a profound moment of evangelization that September morning was. We owe a debt of gratitude to the public media of this country and many other countries who brought us the stunning wall-to-wall -wall coverage and the powerful messages of the Pope last September in Cuba and the United States. Here I must honestly admit, having been working very closely with the secular media in the buildup and the entire time that the Pope was here, that the major networks, the public secular networks, did a far better job in allowing the Pope to speak to us than having that message filtered, distorted, editorialized, and minimized by some commentators claiming to represent faithful Catholic communication networks. I tease my colleagues at CNN that week, having been with them every evening for eight days. I told them this should have been called the Catholic News Network that week because of what you did. You allowed the Pope to speak. And I can guarantee you, working closely with the big ones from CNN, they were deeply moved and they allowed the Pope not only to speak through them, but they were touched by the visit. One of the critiques of Francis's Petrine ministry and teaching heard in these parts is that the Pope is not speaking out enough against abortion. I hear this criticism very often. I assure you that being one who receives the Pope's texts every morning and translating many of them, that he is profoundly pro-life. He offers to the church and the world a consistent ethic of life from its earliest moments of conception to natural death, from womb to tomb. He is doing what the Bishop of Rome and the successor of Peter should do. What is it? To position the evil of abortion within its proper moral context, the failure to recognize the dignity of every single human person at every age and stage of life. Procured abortion is only one of the poisonous fruits from the rotted tree growing in the corrupted garden of the culture of death. Over the past years, he strongly denounced efforts to redefine marriage and issued a thundering condemnation of abortion, euthanasia, and in vitro fertilization, calling them sins against God. Just last week, on January the 22nd, he addressed the Roman Rhoda with these words. The church can show the unfailing merciful God, the love of God to families, especially those wounded by sin and the trials of life, and at the same time, proclaim the essential truth of marriage according to God's design. Pope Francis avoids any opportunity that can lend itself to political manipulation of his person and his words. He's very clear in giving positive messages, even in the most complex situations. He's never against someone. He understands the church to be of the people and not of political or cultural elites. We're unlikely to forget his magnificent unscripted reflection at the great vigil of the World Meeting of Families here in your very city on Benjamin Franklin Parkway on Saturday night, the 26th of September. It was a stunning catechesis on marriage and family life. Here I want to just interject a little story that night. We, were, we had the printed text before us. I was invited to spend those 40 minutes in the booth with CNN, Chris Cuomo and all of his team. Because I had given them the text just beforehand, they were going to allow this thing to go on, the talk to go on, and pizza was ordered. Suddenly, when the Pope handed the text over to Father Mark, and I said, guys, uh, this is not a pizza moment right now. Let's be alert here. And they just leaned over the booth where we were watching this. And Chris, who understands some Italian, and others said, this is big time. Listen to what he's saying. It was a stunning extemporaneous address. The part I loved, almost memorized it that night. When the man and his wife went astray and walked away from God, God did not leave them alone. Such was his love. So great was his love that he began to walk with mankind. He began to walk alongside his people until the right time came. Then he gave them the greatest demonstration of love, his son. And where did he send his son? To a palace? To a city? To an office building? He sent him to a family. God came into the world in a family. And he could do this because that family was a family with a heart open to love, a family whose doors were opened." End of quote. I'd like to consider now three ways in which the Pope is communicating to us through the media, often through the media, core teachings of our faith, fundamental principles of Catholic life. And those three ways are joy, ecology and the environment, and mercy, three things that are hot-button topics right now for the media. First of all, joy. 
which I consider to be the weapon of mass construction, joy. And it's dangerous. It's very dangerous, because many of us don't know what to do with it. In Evangelii Gaudium, the surprise apostolic exhortation that came out three years ago, Francis invites and challenges all of us to move beyond our comfort zones. He asks us to rediscover the joy of being Christian. Quote, an evangelizer must never look like someone who has just come back from a funeral. Let us recover and deepen our enthusiasm, that delightful and comforting joy of evangelizing, even when it is in tears that we must sow. May the world of our time, which is searching, sometimes with anguish, sometimes with hope, be enabled to receive the good news, not from evangelizers who are dejected, discouraged, impatient, or anxious, but from ministers of the gospel whose lives glow with fervor, who have just received the joy of Christ. Francis is asking us to be warm, welcoming, forgiving as Jesus has modeled to us on every page of the New Testament. This morning in Rome, when he addressed the very large jubilee of consecrated life, he reminded thousands of women and men religious in the audience hall that we have a Lord and Master, quote, who shared in the joy of the spouses of Cana of Galilee and the anguish of the widow of Nain, a Lord and Master who enters into the house of Jairus, touched by death, and the house of Bethany, perfumed by nard. He took upon himself illness and suffering to the point of giving his life in ransom. Following Christ means going where he went, taking upon oneself like the Good Samaritan the wounded we encounter along the road, going in search of the lost sheep. To be like Jesus, close to the people, sharing their joys and pains, sharing, showing with our love the paternal face of God and the maternal caress of the church. He wants us to eat with tax collectors and sinners. He wants us to forgive the woman caught in adultery while admonishing her at the same time to go and sin no more. He wants us to welcome and respect foreigners, even our enemies, and above all, not to judge. He's spoken simply, powerfully, and beautifully about returning to a lost unity, a desire to achieve a missing fullness, a disarming invitation to simply come together to witness the beauty and love of Christ. He wants to build bridges that everyone can cross. He's especially conscious of the poor and those who have been marginalized, social outcasts kept on the fringes of society. On being close to people, he writes, an evangelizing community gets involved by word and deed in people's daily lives. It bridges distances. It's willing to abase itself. It's necessary. It embraces human life, touching the suffering flesh of Christ. Evangelization must be an invitation to respond to God's love and to seek the joy in others. And then, if this invitation does not radiate forcefully and attractively, the edifice of the church's moral teaching risks becoming a house of cards, and this is our greatest risk. It would mean that it is not the gospel which is being preached, but certain doctrinal or moral points based on ideological options. In his meeting with the United States Catholic bishops in St. Matthew's Cathedral, the morning of September the 23rd this past year, Francis said, it's not about preaching complicated doctrines, but joyfully proclaiming Christ who died and rose for our sake. The style of our mission should make our hearers feel that the message we preach is meant for us. May the word of God grant meaning and fullness to every aspect of their lives. May the sacraments nourish them with that food which they cannot procure for themselves. May the closeness of the shepherd make them long once again for the Father's embrace. He reminded his brother bishops, we are promoters of a culture of encounter. We are living sacraments of the embrace between God's riches and our poverty. We are witnesses of the abasement and the condescension of God. Dialogue must be our method, not as a shrewd strategy out of fidelity to the one who never wearies of visiting the marketplace, even at the 11th hour, to propose his offer of love. But he took leave of them that morning with these words. Only a church which can gather around the family fire remains able to attract others. And not any fire, but the one which blazed forth on that Easter morn. We need to recognize the Lord's voice as the apostles did on the shore of the Lake of Tiberias. It becomes even more urgent to grow in the certainty that the embers of his presence, kindled in the fire of his passion, precede us and will never die out. Whenever this certainty weakens, we end up being caretakers of ash 
and not guardians and dispensers of the true light and the warmth which causes our hearts to burn within us, end of quote. These words are not only addressed to shepherds and pastors and leaders of the church, but to every single one of us. What he says and how he says it offers a unique model of authentic communication, and the media has listened. Ecology and the environment. Francis's tone in the recent encyclical Laudato Si is passionate, personal, and urgent. He's drafted this major letter with the mind and heart of a disciple of Jesus and the pen and voice of a prophet who has seen and personally experienced the grave injustices and ugliness that human beings can cause on this earth. The encyclical, On the Care of Our Common Home, is addressed to everyone living on this planet, and it calls for a new way of looking at things. We face an urgent crisis when the earth has begun to look, as he says, more like a pile of filth, an immense pile of filth. Still, the encyclical is hopeful, reminding us that God is with us all of us can strive to change course. We must move towards an ecological conversion. Never before has the media spoken so much about what many have wrongly called the climate change manifesto. More than any other encyclical, it draws from the experiences of people around the world and references clearly the findings of Episcopal conferences from Brazil, New Zealand, South Africa, Bolivia, Portugal, Germany, Argentina, the Dominican Republic, the Philippines, Australia, Canada, and the United States. What's the story within the story of Laudato Si? It is an overview of the environmental crisis from a religious point of view, because up till now, the dialogue of the environment, about the environment, has been framed mainly using political, scientific, and economic language. Now, the language of faith has entered decisively and systematically. Laudato Si is a perfect example how the church at the highest level understands the modern world, enters into profound dialogue with the modern world, and repeats again her age-old message of salvation in a new way. Laudato Si is rooted in the concrete realities of our times. With Laudato Si, Francis is laying the groundwork for a new Christian humanism rooted in the simple and beautiful image of Jesus that he presents for the world's consideration. For in the end, it is the name and mission of Jesus of Nazareth that the Pope issues his call to conversion, a compelling invitation for each of us to look at the earth and all of its creatures with the loving eyes and the heart of Jesus Christ. With Laudato Si, we learn to cherish the world that God so loved, the world that housed his son and welcomed his son, and we learn to adore the son who has been given to us. Mercy. In the well-known programmatic jubilee text of Luke chapter 4, we read that Jesus stood up to read as they handed in the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord has been given to me, or the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Very significantly, the last line of Isaiah chapter 61 verse 2, or the 61 verse 1, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And immediately afterwards, Jesus' message was a declaration that precisely this text is being fulfilled in your hearing. The expression of Isaiah 61, year of the Lord's favor, clearly refers to the prescriptions of the book of Leviticus for the Jubilee year. Therefore, at Nazareth, we can say Jesus is announcing the Jubilee year. But there's something very odd at how the Isaiah text was used on Jesus' lips. The gospel does not quote the whole phrase of Isaiah, which includes two complements of the object after the verb. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, but then it says, a, a day of vengeance for our God. That part does not include it in the New Testament proclamation. The quotation of Isaiah foresees two aspects of divine in, in, intervention. The first being the liberation of the Jewish people the second being the punishment or destruction of her enemies. The gospel has not retained this opposition. It's not evident when you read the story in Luke. The omission clearly has two consequences for us. The message contains nothing negative. It's implicitly universal. There's no suggestion of distinction between Jews and non-Jews. This is a discrete preparation for the universal nature of the gospel of Luke. 
which will become explicit after the death and resurrection of Jesus, when the most fundamental liberation from sin will be proclaimed in his name to all the people. Luke chapter 24. Therefore, universal openness is an essential character of the proclamation of the good news and the sharing of our story. I stress this point because this is certainly underlying the choice of this year as a jubilee year. On March 13th, a year ago, when he surprised the world by announcing the Jubilee, he told us he wants the Jubilee to go deeper spiritually, to be a far-reaching Christian witness of mercy to the world. Mercy is a very dear theme to Pope Francis, as evident even in his Episcopal motto, miserando atque eligendo, literally, chosen through the eyes of mercy. During the first Angelus, after his election to the See of Peter, he stated, I quote, feeling mercy that this word changes everything. This is the best thing we can feel. It changes the world. A little mercy makes the world less cold and more just. We need to understand properly this mercy of God, this merciful Father who's so patient, end of quote. For Francis, mercy is the interpretive key to the gospel of Jesus. Francis had his first profound experience of mercy at the age of 17, when on his way to a high school dance in Buenos Aires, he went into a church to go to confession, and he describes that moment as a very special moment, a decisive moment. He experienced the call to the priesthood. Throughout his priestly ministry, he sought to give concrete expression to God's mercy. As he wrote recently, mercy is not just a pastoral attitude, it is the very substance of the gospel message. What's the story within the story of the Jubilee of Mercy? He wants to bring the whole church, starting with cardinals, bishops, priests, and consecrated persons to open themselves to God's mercy and to find concrete, creative ways to put mercy into practice in every area of ministry. As Bishop of Rome, he's blazing the trail by word and deed, showing what mercy means in relation to the poor, the homeless, prisoners, immigrants, the sick, and the persecuted. They are, for him, the flesh of Christ. In the same optic of mercy, he's called for the abolition of the death penalty and life imprisonment, which he calls the hidden death penalty. In his homily to new cardinals last February, he recalled that the church's way from the time of the Council of Jerusalem has always been the way of Jesus, the way of mercy and reinstatement. This means welcoming the repentant prodigal son, healing the wounds of sin with courage and determination, rolling up our sleeves and not standing by and watching passively the suffering of the world. He has a certain art of communicating that he's transmitted to the Pontifical Council of Social Communications, which up till now has been responsible for the publication of the letter that comes out every year on January 24th, Feast of Francis de Sales, and the actual day of world communications is on Ascension Sunday. For his first world day of communications, he had a direct hand in the wording of the letter. Being a member of that council, I saw how it works on the inside. He stressed, how can communication be at the service of an authentic culture of encounter? What does it mean for us as disciples to encounter others in light of the gospel? How can we be neighborly in our use of communications? Then, of course, he always ends up with a gospel parable. He loves the parables. And he said, in the gospel parable of the Good Samaritan, it is a parable about communication. Those who communicate, in effect, in, in effect become neighbors. The Good Samaritan not only draws nearer to the man he finds half dead on the side of the road, he takes responsibility for him. Jesus shifts our understanding. It's not just about seeing the other as someone like myself, but of the ability to make myself like the other. Communication is about realizing that we are all human beings, children of God. Last year, 2015, the World Day of Communications, he reminded us that modern media, which are an essential part of life, for young people in particular, can be both a help and a hindrance to communication in and between families. I quote, the media can be a hindrance if they become a way to avoid listening to others, to evade physical contact, to fill up every moment of silence and rest so that we forget that silence is an integral element of communication. The media can help communication when they enable people to share their stories, to stay in contact with different friends, to thank others and to seek forgiveness. And this year's letter, which was released last week, which will be formally promulgated on Sunday, Ascension Sunday, 
Francis wrote, communication is the power to build bridges to enable encounter and inclusion that thus enrich society. The words of Christians ought to be a constant encouragement to communion, and even in those cases where they must firmly condemn evil, they should never try to rupture relationships and communication. Our primary task, he says, is to uphold the truth with love. And then, it's not technology which determines whether or not communication is authentic, but rather the human heart and our capacity to use wisely the means at our disposal. Social networks can facilitate relationships and promote the good of society, but they can also lead to further polarization and division between individuals and groups. An image which has captivated many of us in the media and those of us in the church and outside the church has been his use of the word field hospitals. Many think that he's coined this expression. This is unique to Bergoglio. But let me tell you, the expression is not unique to Francis. It's drawn from the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola. When Francis speaks of the church as a field hospital after battle, he appeals to Ignatius' understanding of the role of the church in light of God's gaze upon the world. He says, so many people ask us to be close to them. They ask us for what they were asking of Jesus, closeness, nearness, proximity. It's the opposite image of a fortress under siege. The image of, a field, of the church as a field hospital is not just a simple, pretty, poetic metaphor, literary device, because from this image, we can der derive an understanding of both the church's mission and the sacraments of salvation. Field hospitals, by their very nature, indicate a battleground, a struggle, suffering, confusion, emergency, and they foster dialogue and encounter, conversation and meeting, consolation, compassion, and the binding of wounds. Because my topic this evening is specifically about communications and media, I'd like to indicate two areas where field hospitals are badly needed. And not only hospital structures, but caregivers willing to step into the battle and to bring healing. And here are the two areas. The first area is new media and young people. There's no question that the church has entered the whole world of new media with bravado and great zeal. I remain concerned at times that we do so without careful reflection at what is really happening in this new universe. Does the use of new media serve to deepen our attentiveness to the presence of God, to the risen Christ to the, and the living spirit, to the community gathered about us and to the world in which we are called to minister? In the digital world, no matter how hasty, undigested, unreflected the responses may be from our audience, our patient listening must always triumph. Internet culture conditions us to think that quick, instant responses to complex questions are often the most valuable responses. It is then that we teachers and pastors simply become choreographers of immediacy rather than midwives of a slower wisdom. Many times in the new media culture, our flight from conversation can mean diminished chances to learn skills of self-reflection. It's hard to do anything when you have 2,000 intimate Facebook friends, except to connect. We think of constant connection that will make us feel less lonely. Many times the opposite is true. If we're unable to be alone, we are far more likely to be lonely. Most of us, we need to remember, in between text messages, tweets, probes, likes, prompts, emails, and Facebook posts, need to listen to one another, even to the boring conversations, because it's often in unedited moments, moments in which we hesitate, stammer, stutter, cry, and go silent, that we reveal our deepest selves to one another. In today's schools, universities, and workplaces, so many people who have grown up fearing conversation show up at work or on jobs with earphones. I walk into them every morning in the building where I live. I slam into somebody every single morning because people don't look up anymore. They're looking at the handheld device. Walking through the big newsrooms of TV networks, as I have to do often in New York or Washington, visiting journalists at major newspapers, strolling through university and even seminary libraries and sleek downtown offices, or at times through our Salt and Light studios in Toronto, I see the same thing. We're together, but each of us is in our own bubble. 
furiously connected to keyboards and tiny touch screens, were working away quietly and diligently at workstations with a whole array of, array of technology spread before us, laptops, iPads, iPods, multiple cell phones. Some wear discrete earphones, while others wear big ones akin to helicopter pilots or operators of large machinery. No one dare break the silence with a greeting of, hello, how are you doing? How was the weekend? In the silence of supposed connection, we are carefully kept at bay and we keep one another at bay. As we get used to being shortchanged on conversation and to getting by with less, we seem almost willing to dispense with people altogether. It is our role, especially as pastoral ministers, as believers, to tell people to look up, look at one another. Let's start the conversation. Francis warms us in Evangelii Gaudium. I quote, some people want their interpersonal relationships provided by sophisticated equipment, by screens and systems which can be turned on, off, or erased. He continues, the gospel tells us constantly to run the risk of face-to-face -face encounter with others, with their personal presence which challenges us, with their pain and their pleas, with their joy which infects us. And the second area where field hospitals are badly needed is the digital world, what many call the Catholic blogosphere. Let me call to mind a second battleground which, where a hospital is badly needed. We can each name a country or land where blood, terror, and violence seem to have the upper hand. But the big battlefield before all of humanity is also the digital world, one that requires no passport, airline ticket, or ticket to travel or to enter. You only need a keyboard, a screen, or a handheld device with Wi-Fi connection. It's in that universe that many wars are waged every day, where many wounded souls live, walk, or troll. It's an immense battleground that needs many field hospitals set up to bind wounds and to reconcile warring parties, or to tell people simply to shut up. In the wild, crazy world of the blogosphere, especially the Catholic blogosphere, there is the challenge of accountability and responsibility. On the internet, there's no accountability, as you know. There's no code of ethics, no responsibility for anyone's words or actions. It can be an international weapon of mass destruction, the send all button, crossing time zones, borders, and space. In its wake is often character assassination, destruction of reputation, calumny, libel, slander, and defamation. And woe be it if your blog has a Latin title. It sounds even more enticing with the Vatican crest on it. Many of my non-Christian and non-believing friends and many in the media world have remarked to me, look at what you people do to one another. You've turned the internet into a cesspool of hatred, venom, and vitriol, condemnation, and excommunication, all in the name of defending the faith. The character of nation on the internet by those claiming to be Catholic and faithful Catholics and Christian has often produced a graveyard of corpses strewn all around. What view of us do others have? If we judged our identity based on some Catholic blogs and websites, we would be known as the people who hate everything. I recently read a website which said the Pope made a big mistake in calling a jubilee of mercy. It should be the jubilee of condemnation. If anything, we must be known as the people who stand for someone, for something, something positive that can transform lives and engage and impact culture. To what degree are our blogs and websites really the expression of the wealth of the Christian patrimony, of successfully transmitting the good news that the Lord has asked us to spread? And with young men and women in religious formation and formation for the priesthood, we have our work cut out for us, and the church has not yet risen to the occasion of proper formation of young adults and people supposedly defending the faith who don't know what they're doing using this very important instrument. This evening, among us and in this great seminary, there are dozens of field hospital workers ready for deployment. On these new battlefields today, we must go and let the light of Christ shine before us that kindly light that Cardinal Newman spoke of, the light that goes before us into the night, a light that attracts and warms and consoles and clarifies. Let me conclude with a word on Cardinal Foley. 
If Vatican communications are undergoing the massive reform that they're experiencing at present, so much of this is due to the quiet, painstaking, often hidden, and underappreciated groundbreaking work of the late Cardinal Foley. Everything I have said in this presentation was present and found in his life, especially in the 23 years that he headed the Pontifical Council for Social Communications. His goodness, humanity, kindness, and humor, genuine interest in others and compassion. He spread the joy of Christ, especially for tens of thousands of media, journalists, and media personnel. John Patrick Foley of Philadelphia won the hearts of tens of thousands of people because he opened doors for them, listened to them, told them puns and jokes, held their hands, and removed obstacles which prevented people from drawing closer to the church. And I can attest to that. When I was assigned to World Youth Day, the first person I met in Rome in 1999 was Cardinal Foley. And he took me by the hand. He was Archbishop then, and he opened doors. And the second one was Father Roberto Tucci, later a cardinal, Father Tucci, a Jesuit who died last year. Three things Cardinal Foley taught me will always remain with me. As I was preparing for World Youth Day in 2002, he told me to be sure to spend much time with journalists, all journalists, left, right, center, mixed up, confused, well-informed or misinformed. He said, take them by the hand, don't dismiss their foolish questions, challenge where necessary, answer when possible, and thank them always when they have done a good job. Remember well one of his sayings to me over lunch in the Borgo Pio, we're very good at criticizing complaining and writing people off when they've done a poor job in covering a story or when they smear us. But we do a terrible job in thanking them when they got it right. Second, he told me that every single encounter with journalists must be considered a moment of catechesis and evangelization. And these words stuck. Even though we may not use the words, I'm here to evangelize you or catechize you. If I said that, I'd be thrown out of ABC or CBS. There's not one single moment that's gone by where something about religion, about God, about faith has come up. And this has been especially true over the past three years in the official capacity of assisting Father Lombardi. Every time I've been at ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, Australian Broadcasting, or BBC, someone walks me out of the building and says, would you mind coming to my office for a minute? I wanted to ask you a question, which turns into a half an hour or 45 minutes and sometimes even confession. He tells me, use every opportunity as a teaching moment. Always be kind, express gratitude for their interest in us, even though some of it may be misplaced, misguided, or misinformed. And I quote this. I had written it in my diary. And thirdly, he told me at the height of the hoopla over the Da Vinci Code back in 2004, he said, when well-meaning Catholics demand that you protest booksellers, writers, movie houses for presenting negative or false images of the church, don't join those crusades, Tom. They only help to include, increase sales of books and help to break all box office records. Rather, seize the opportunity to present the alternative story, which is the truth. That's our story. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, at the Cardinal's funeral, at Cardinal Foley's funeral in 2011 in your cathedral, said this about him. It was just a few days before Christmas. Cardinal Foley's was a courtesy that was so impeccable and the thoughtfulness that was so unfailing that we might not be surprised to, sign, to find his photograph in the Pictionary for the entry under gentlemen, a holiness in his foliness that was evident without being overbearing, a depth to his intellect which could itself express itself with warmth and childlikeness. Cardinal John Patrick Foley laid the groundwork for Pope Francis's dynamic and creative, successful outreach to the media today. Over 23 years of often hidden work at our home office on the Tiber, John Patrick Foley showed the seeds for a new springtime of evangelization in the church. May this good shepherd of Philadelphia rest in peace, intercede for us, continue to inspire us, and show us how to be good communicators, how to work closely with the media, and through them, to teach the world. Thank you.